Legend has it that back in the mystical age of the early 21st century, a fandom was renewed by an adaptation. It was a book that fans said was unfilmable, a book that told an epic story, created a vivid world, and breathed new life into the fantasy genre. Then, along came a director by the name of Peter Jackson, who took on the daunting project of making three movie adaptations of this work. Despite skepticism from fans, the movies were a commercial and critical success, and thanks to the popularity of the internet, the fandom spread across the world and a new generation of fans was born. And yet, even the new internet-savvy fandom could not capture the fervor of the original, which left behind a legacy so far-reaching, it continues to be the basis of many fantasy stories and role-playing games today. And yet, the movies renewed that legacy and even created one of their own. Epic movies had fallen by the wayside, and this was as epic as it got. This movie was groundbreaking in many of the ways it told its story, from the sheer vastness of its scope to the technology used for effects like Gollum. It breathed new life into a fandom that had formerly devolved into a collection of obsessive nerds and people who, in their 40s, were still living in their parents' basement. Excuse me, now you're just being unfair. The fandom was still alive and well, even if the younger generations couldn't see it, distracted as they were by their video games and cheesy 90s movies. Oh look, they said, this has such pretty images and pretty people, it must be good, right? Never realizing that without the substance of the book and the brilliance of Tolkien's imagination, these movies, or any movies of this magnitude, wouldn't even exist. Wow. Okay, you want to talk about flash versus substance? Let's talk about how much time Tolkien wastes on meaningless descriptions and songs just for the sake of showing off his own brilliance. Maybe the film's fandom is just smart enough to realize that the film knows how to tell a compelling story better than the prattling of the book. Maybe they realize that sometimes visuals and subtlety and emotion Speak louder than just words, words, and more words. Don't you think there's a reason why people said this story was unfilmable? You want to talk to Ralph Bashke and his failed attempt? Oh yeah, unfilmable. So unfilmable that not only did the film succeed on every conceivable level, but the first film made it onto the AFI's list of the greatest 100 films of all time. Oh, fooey on the AFI. This book is on practically every list of must-read literature ever created. People still read them every year. Oh, and the movies haven't made similar lists? And people don't have parties where they watch all 12 hours of the extended version? Oh, there, just screwed yourself with that argument. Extended versions? Would the extended versions even need to exist if not for the fact that fans needed more of the book? Oh, in please. The they did that just to placate white Excuse fans me. like you need to have every single reading oh, detail just so. The Girl. real fans know. Girls! What? Girls, we talked about this. You can't start arguing before the review even starts. We need to remain objective here. But you, you don't, don't understand the first book. Girls, girls, it's girls, girls, no, stop! Leave the review to the reviewers. We need to get on with it. Oh, fine. And so, it was that in 2005, the magical site known as YouTube was created, giving way to amateur critics who could give their opinion of books and movies freely. And thus, discord emerged among the YouTube trolls, each passionately fighting for dominance. Though some more right than others. Hush your noise. And this review especially seemed to create a rift between the fans so great that it threatened to tear the world apart. Reigning over this discord was the giant squid of anger, egging on fans to greater and greater trolldom. Until it seemed that no sort of peace could be reached. But then one day, one lone reviewer with a modest YouTube following began comparing books and movies. His hats of reason enabled him to see the advantages and disadvantages of each, and come to a fair, reasonable conclusion that still invited disagreement. But he championed the concept of agreeing to disagree, while all around him, the trolls still raged. The review of this story, mentioned briefly in an introductory video, sat in the back of his mind and the minds of his followers, biding its time. And he avoided it for as long as he could, but the Lord of the Reviews demanded to be done. Could he do it with his quiet fairness and reason? 
or with the way of the YouTube trolls and forces of the giant squid of anger threaten to overtake him? We shall see. <clears throat> um, hello. Uh, Scottish reviewer here. Sorry about all that uh, business back there. Uh, we'll just proceed onward. <clears throat> my friends, my neighbors, welcome. Welcome to the beginning of the third season of Books vs. Movie. Can we turn the echo off? Yeah, thanks. Today we begin our 31st review. Well, actually, technically it's already begun, <clears throat> but no matter. Ever since we began this series, we've had request after request after request for this review. It's a substantial undertaking, as both book and movie are quite substantial themselves. They've also both gained quite a following, each quite passionate about their own version. And we're here to decide which version is better, and it's going to cause a bit of controversy no matter what we decide. Many fans might not accept the decision we made, and many might hate us as a result. Yet we will try to be as fair and unbiased as we possibly... Good grief, this review is terrifying. I don't want any part of this. I'm out of here. Start the intro. Going so soon, Scotty. What do you mean, going so soon? I'm not even supposed to be a part of this. I'm a theater reviewing guy. You know why you're needed here. <laughs> yeah, and I've done my bit. So I leave the review now in the capable hands of Hatter and Reg. And do you really think Reg is up to this? Trust me, Reg has come a long way in 30 reviews. I won't be far if you need me for any incidental scenes. Oh, and by the way, the review's already started. How? The mystical voices. Damn it! I told them they were the ones to save you! Look, it's already starting. It's even affecting the exposition. Events have already been set in motion, then. I am deeply troubled by this. This is no ordinary review, Scotty. I believe we shall have to do something we've never done before. I believe we shall have to make this... a nine-round review. Nine rounds? That's unheard of. Sometimes even seven is pushing it. Need I remind you that the Harry Potter Books vs. Movies review is over half an hour long and it is only five rounds. Still, it's daunting. But if what you say is true, round one is already underway. The mystical voices argued about legacy, but they didn't come to a conclusion. Have you? Oh yeah. Books obviously left the bigger legacy. And what makes you say that? Well, setting aside the fact that the movies wouldn't even exist without it, and the fact that you really can't define the legacy of something that's only been around for a decade, you really can't look at anything in the fantasy genre, whether it be book, movie, game, whatever, and not see the influence of Lord of the Rings in some way. Put it another way, if the movies disappeared tomorrow, the books would still be immensely popular and widely read. If the books disappeared tomorrow, the fantasy genre would be irreparably changed. The movies have left their mark too, don't get me wrong, but it's pretty obvious that the mark left by the books is greater. Alright then, one round down, Scotty. Eight to go. Wait a minute, you tricked me! Don't worry, you have played your part. You may go now. <sighs> the road goes ever blah blah blah. Hey, I'm a Stumbledore. Uh, Scotty just left in kind of a hurry. What's going on? Reg, I... I fear the time is upon us. Much sooner than I anticipated. The review is underway. Wait... Are you sure? You know, I was kind of hoping for a break. I just got done fighting this... I know, I know. Crossovers can take a lot out of you, but... It's already started. Round one is complete. What? How? The mystical voices. Good grief, again! I know, I know, I'm going to have words. <sighs> so we've already started, huh? Who's winning? Book at the moment, but be careful, Reg. We can't afford to have you slip back into the grasping arms of bias and unreason. Grasping, uh... You've mellowed considerably in the last two years, Reg. But there are those who would have this review turn into an all-out brawl, and we cannot allow it. You must carry out this review with all the reason and fairness we've come to expect. Honestly, I think in this instance you have to be more worried about Hatter than about me. 
Uh, come to think of it, where is Hatter anyway? I haven't seen him for days. Looking for you, actually. And on a mission, spying out the enemy. And I must go meet him now. If I don't return by the next scene, you must carry on with the review. You must carry this review to the very ends of the Earth! What? Why? It's an epic story, Reg. It must be done in an epic fashion. Yeah, but to the very ends of the Earth? That seems a little drastic. How about just to the end of Slippery Elm Trail? Very well. Take the review to North Baltimore. Finish it, and dispose of it. Right. And do not travel alone, Reg. Take number three with you. Number three? Why? Because he's been listening to this whole conversation. No, I haven't. Right. I must go now. Don't let the darkness overtake you. Dramatic fellow, isn't he? You have no idea. Hatter, there you are. You need to find Reg and get back to the... Hatter? Yes, again. You. Where is Hatter? Damn if I know. Can I help it if you guys can't tell the two of us apart? I mean, is it really that hard to tell the difference between a black hoodie and a white hoodie? Fair enough. But, but what are you doing here? I'm here for the review, Ami. You didn't really think I'd miss out on this one, did you? No. No, I won't let you. You... What do I call you anyway? Not, not Evil Hatter, sure. No, 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 that's lame. I prefer the Evil Haberdasher. <laughs> yeah, because that's so much less lame. Hey, shut up! Anyway, what, you won't let me? You can't stop me. <sighs> Please, you know that doesn't threaten me, Ami. Why don't you just admit it? You can't do this review without Discord. It's one of the few cases where the passion for the book and the passion for the movie are even. You can't do this without bias. Reg is too susceptible to it, and Hatter... <laughs> well, even hats of reason only go so far. I think you've underestimated your competition. Please, I know them like you know them. Surely you figured that out by now. Well, very well. Let's see how your intrepid group of reviewers does with round two, protagonists. No! Hey guys, guys, check this out. Boom, 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 boom. Bum 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 Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, hey, come on, number three, we need, a th we need another voice. Hey, come on, Reg, you can join in too. You had to bring him with us, didn't you? Hey, it was either that or leave them alone in the apartment. Fair enough. I was wondering when you guys would figure it out. You mean how when you told Scotty that you were heading home that you weren't talking about the apartment? Yeah, it wasn't too hard to figure out. Hey, keep your voice. The trolls are everywhere. Trolls? Trolls. They're not expecting the review to be done here. Anyway, it seems as though the second round has already begun. What? But we haven't said anything yet. The whole system's out of control. Someone else, someone masquerading as me, is starting this. Well, perfect. We don't even know what the next round is. Yes, we do. The first round was Legacy, so naturally the second round will be about the main protagonists. Well, that should be easy enough, right? But who are the main protagonists? Frodo? Frodo and Sam? The whole Fellowship? Well, well we have to talk about Frodo. Uh, no matter what way you slice it, this is his story. It's his task to take the ring to Mount Doom and destroy it. True. And this is the first of many, many examples of the movie's fantastic casting. You're looking for a hero in Frodo, but also someone who is young, innocent, and vulnerable. And Elijah Wood delivers that in spades. He looks like a kid who's just plain out of his element, and the advantage to that is it shows the sheer amount of growth that Frodo went through. By making him seem younger and less sure of himself than he was in the book, the movie draws a sharp contrast between Frodo at the beginning of the story and Frodo at the end of the story. The thing about movie Frodo is that while he does grow considerably, Considerably, that has more to do with the fact that he just experienced something deeply traumatizing than anything he actually learned. Really, the only real difference between the Frodo at the beginning of the movies and the Frodo at the end of the movies is that he's sadder. And he just seems so 
lost throughout this whole thing, as though he's either barely aware of what's going on, or he's so frightened and weak that he has to have the stronger members of the Fellowship carry out everything for him. Take the stabbing at Weathertop, for example. In the book, Frodo fights through the entire ordeal, even though he's basically dying. And afterwards, he does his best to keep up, he rides solo to Rivendell, and he even stands up to the ring wraiths. In the movie, he's basically being carried the whole way, first by Aragorn and the other hobbits, and then later by Arwen, a character who doesn't even feature at this point in the book. And if not for these characters, he would have just given in to the illness. The climax of both stories illustrates this as well. In both versions of the story, Frodo eventually succumbs to the power of the ring. He gets it to Mount Doom, but then he decides he's not going to destroy it, and it's only because Gollum attacks him that the ring even gets destroyed at all. And in both stories, there are signs that he is fighting against the power of the ring, but in the book, it's much more of a personal power struggle, like a test of his own endurance and fortitude. In the movie, well... Honestly, Frodo seems so much like an angsty teenager, and his character just seems so weak at times that it's really no surprise at the end where he succumbs to the ring. It's like the inevitable happened, whereas with the book Frodo, it's like the last of his incredible strength is gone, and he fought right up to the very end, but it was finally just too much, and so we still admire his strength, even though he still capitulates to the power of the ring. Well, if we're going to talk about Frodo, we have to talk about Sam as well. It's both of their stories, after all. It's the tale of Frodo the Nine-Fingered and Samwise the Brave that they keep referring to. And really, most of the Frodo-Sam scenes after Fellowship are from Sam's point of view. A lot of this is his story. In both versions of the story, Sam is the loyal best friend who is going to stand by Mr. Frodo and help him destroy the ring no matter what happens. And again, we have great casting here with Sean Astin playing Sam, and he plays the part beautifully. And actually, of the four hobbits, Sam from the movie seems the most hobbit-like, at least as far as hobbits are described in the book, but more on that in a moment. In fact, it would basically be a tie between book Sam and movie Sam if not for one aspect of movie Sam that bugs me a little bit. In fact, it's not even an aspect of his character as really one scene in Return of the King. At the beginning of Return of the King, we see that Gollum slash Smeagol is negatively influencing Frodo, and we know from the end of Two Towers that he is going to lead them both into the lair of Shelob. And it finally gets to the point where Frodo orders Sam to leave, and Sam does. What bugs me about this is that at the end of Fellowship, Frodo also orders Sam to leave, but Sam doesn't obey. Sam actually wades out into a deep river to go after Frodo to Mordor, even though Sam can't swim. So if he's not going to heed his order to leave then, why would he heed his order to leave now? Especially when he knows that Gollum is negatively influencing Frodo. This just doesn't mesh, even with the established character of the movie, who would have said... Tough, Mr. Frodo, I'm staying anyway. In the book, the only reason Sam ever left Frodo is because he thought Frodo was dead and he needed to carry out the mission of destroying the ring. And like I said, for the most part, the movie Sam is great, and this is really the only weak spot, but it is a weak spot. Hey, can you guys settle something for uh, number two and me? We're kind of in the middle of something here, if you could... But it's, it's relevant to what you're talking about, we promise. Uh, we're trying to figure out whether Merry and Pippin were meant to be pivotal characters or just comic relief. Yeah, we relate to them a lot for some reason. <clears throat> well, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, it kind of depends on whether you're talking about book or movie here. I mean, the movie characters are definitely meant to be comic relief, at least at first. They're goofballs and kind of vaguely stupid, and they're very clearly out of their element throughout most of Fellowship. It isn't really until the events of the Two Towers and Return of the King where they start to come into their own and grow up and show a little confidence. Both book and movie characters end in about the same place, with Merry and Pippin as respected soldiers of Rohan and Gondor, respectively. But because of where the movie characters started out as these kind of goofy, bumbling idiots, the growth of their characters is that much more dramatic. Merry and Pippin of the book, however, while they do have their light-hearted moments, are much more serious characters. Pippin is still the youngest and the fool of the took, of course, but both of them are much more competent here. They're able to hold their own in the elements fairly well, and they're traveling with Frodo because of their loyalty to him, and not just because they think it'll be hella fun. And they're definitely still pivotal characters, but the book is more about finding those qualities within themselves rather than developing those qualities from nothing. That's very true. And that really gets into J.R.R. Tolkien's creation of the Hobbits in general. We see this in Tolkien's previous novel, the one that this is a sequel to, The Hobbit, with Bilbo Baggins. Hobbits are constantly being underestimated. 
They're not fighters, they don't look like much, they rarely leave their homeland, and they're pretty laid back as a rule, spending most of their time eating, drinking, smoking, or sleeping. But as is shown throughout the story, hobbits also have incredible fortitude. Though they seem soft, they're actually incredibly tough, which is why both Bilbo and Frodo are able to withstand the power of the ring for so long. And the fact is, neither of them was ever meant to be the young, vigorous hero. They're both in their 50s when they set out on their journey, and how many middle-aged heroes do you read about? Sam's story reflects this too, because Sam is underestimated even by his own kind. And yet in the story, he proves himself to be a loyal friend, a quick thinker, and someone who will get the job done and keep plugging ahead even when all hope seems lost. Merry and Pippin, who actually feature in a fair amount of the story as well, prove themselves in battle, whether it's a battle against a supernatural being or a battle against a mad steward. When it comes right down to it, this is the Hobbit's story, illustrating their strength and fortitude in whatever situation they happen to find themselves in. There's also the whole scouring of the Shire thing, but I think we'll wait until the last round to talk about that. At any rate, the Hobbits are the featured protagonists, the pivotal characters, and much more indicative of that underestimated toughness than the movie Hobbits are. That covers two rounds. Now, we're being watched. Well, yeah, it's a review, Hatter. They're usually being watched. Come on, we need to meet with the other personas. We'll get them together and be back at the apartment. Let's go. I'll drive. Alright, we all know why we're here. I don't. Most of us know why we're here. Uh, you might want to give a little explanation to the audience. Exposition has been a little lacking. Alright, fine. As you all know, back in October, shortly after the Harry Potter Books vs. Movies review, Cassie, or rather pretentious director, cast Expella Reviewist on Matt, separating him into regular Matt and the Matt Hatter. But, the spell did more than that. It in fact fragmented him into seven different personas, six of whom are in this room. Amish Dumbledore, Hatter, Reg, Captain Obvious, Editing Matt, and myself, we are all fragments of the original Matt, and one of us holds the source to that original Matt. All of us are drawn to that source, which is why we have all ended up here, but there is one persona who is not here figure in the white hoodie. He calls himself the evil haberdasher, and he is in many ways the anti-hatter. The hats that he stole, he has corrupted somehow. Rather than bestowing the wearer with logic and reason, they instead turn him into a creature of bias and prejudice. We don't know exactly how he has accomplished this. He turns the hat backwards. What, did nobody else notice? He just turns Hatter's hat backwards. Red, you just did the review of Epic Movie with one of Hatter's hats on backwards, right? You wore one of my hats? Well, technically it was in the Shadow Realm, so it wasn't... The point really... is, he has corrupted everything that we stand for in a review. He is leading the forces of the giant squid of anger, and he will do everything in his power to turn this review into an all-out brawl between the fandoms. The review is too volatile to be done by one, or even two. We need a team, a fellowship, if you will, to carry out this review and take it on the epic journey that the genre of this video requires. And Reg is the source? It's kind of obvious, isn't it? I mean, he is technically the original Matt, isn't he? Hey, now you're taking my job! What's he talking about? Never mind, Reg. E.T., the source isn't important right now. What's important is that we're able to get through this review. Now, most of the burden is going to lie on Reg and me, and if we're gonna be honest, really more on Reg, since he doesn't have the hats of reason. I can handle it. There's one thing I've learned over the past two years of doing this, it's how to keep an open mind. And I'm gonna have to if this is gonna work. Well, you won't be alone, Reg. You'll have my reason. And my editing tricks. And my obvious statements. Will someone please explain what I'm doing here? All right then. Reg, Hatter, Editing Matt, Captain Obvious, and... E.T. will take the review on its journey. On which double door you'll lead them. What about me? Yes, number three, you'll be going too, seeing as how you've been listening to this entire conversation. No, I haven't. That's seven. For 
we're really going to parody this story property, we should have a fellowship of nine. Well, no. Yeah, and we totally haven't been listening either. Shut up. All right then. You are the fellowship of the review. Really? So, if the Hobbits are better in the book, what about the rest of the Fellowship? Well, the rest of the Fellowship isn't pivotal exactly, but they're still very much the force behind everything else that happens in the story. Even when they break up, we still follow all of the members, and it's the Fellowship who's fighting the main battle. Uh, hang on though, Aragorn's a pivotal character, isn't he? In the movies, maybe, but not in the book. He's still a ranger who is really a king, but in the book at least, he's pretty much ready to be king from the beginning, even though he isn't... king for some reason. He exhibits a lot of leadership, seems confident and sure of himself, is very much a diplomat, and is often compared to Gandalf throughout much of the story. Also, because he's a ranger, he knows Middle-earth backwards and forwards. The movie Aragorn, however, is definitely a pivotal character. A lot of the story is about him and his journey to becoming king. He isn't just ready to be king from the beginning, he has to grow into that role throughout the story. We see a very vulnerable side to the character in the movie, as well as a very passionate side that doesn't come through quite as strongly in the book. Actually, it's similar to the difference between the two versions of The Hobbits. The book focuses more on the strengths that are already inside the character and how they use them in whatever situation they happen to be thrown into, whereas the movie focuses more on developing those strengths and growing from something of an underdog to a mighty force to be reckoned with. And while the book method made more sense for The Hobbits, I kind of like the movie's portrayal of the Aragorn character. He's a little young and not nearly as strong as the book character, but I do like that you get to see some of the struggles that he goes through through and being a ranger becoming king. The characters are good for different reasons, and honestly, it's kind of a toss-up for me. You sure you wanted a jump cut there? You want to just let me do this? I'm just saying, he wasn't quite finished with his bit yet. Good grief. I never should have let you edit. That split screen's a little rough. You might want to feather the edges a little bit. Will you shut up? Okay, okay. Just trying to be helpful. So what do you think they're going to say about Legolas and Gimli? Well, I don't know about Gimli, but Legolas is basically interchangeable with his movie counterpart. You think so? Well, he's a fairly typical elf by all accounts. Immortal, strong, athletic, kind of cocky. And the book doesn't really give him much characterization beyond that. And Gimli's pretty much the same, basically just the lovable gruff dwarf in both versions of the story, though the movie plays him up for comedy a little bit more. But I don't think the individual characterizations are as important anyway. No? Well, it's not really the point of either character. Legolas and Gimli are an elf and a dwarf, two races who have been feuding with each other for years and years. And yet here they are, against all odds, not only traveling to each other and fighting alongside each other, but becoming very close friends in the process. That's a good point. And when you think about it, the book doesn't really establish this rivalry enough for that friendship to have much of an impact. They mention that the two races don't historically get along, but there's not a lot of evidence to support that statement. There's not really any kind of tension between Gimli and the other elves, no hostile words are exchanged anyway. They're just kind of standing around talking until one of them says, Oh yeah, that's right, I remember, we don't like each other. Exactly, but the movie shows palpable tension between the two races when Gimli tries to enter Lothlorien. I mean, they look like they're ready to start brawling, which makes the friendship that develops between Legolas and Gimli that much more impactful. And I love the relationship that forms between them. They're like brothers. They bicker and argue all the time, but there's definitely a bond that forms between them, and a close one. Captain, quick, give me a segue. Um... Anyone ever tell you you look kind of like Gandalf? Gandalf! Yes, Gandalf! Let's look at Gandalf! He's an interesting character in the book, a very powerful creature who nonetheless is fascinated by hobbits, a race that most people, especially people as powerful as he is, have completely written off. And while I enjoy his character in the book, well, Ian McKellen. He does a masterful job in this role, portraying so many levels of nuance to a character who is basically just your wise mentor figure. He's clever and powerful, but can also be weak and frail at times. He's very clearly otherworldly, but is still very deeply touched by worldly affairs. Also, 
He's just a freaking badass. And finally, Boromir, the man who succumbed to temptation and attempted to take the ring from Frodo. And in the movie, I believe that this character is a little too... Obvious. Exactly. I mean, with over-the-top scenes like this, you can tell that he's going to be the Judas figure who's going to betray everyone. And because of this portrayal, he's often written off as a bad guy by many modern fans, when really, he's anything but. What Boromir is, at least in the book, is a man. Fallible and flawed, yes, but with many virtues as well, including bravery and, yes, even loyalty to a cause. I don't know if he would have been a Hufflepuff, but he does die trying to save the hobbits, don't forget. He represents both the pride and arrogance that makes men susceptible to Sauron's influence, and also the great bravery and loyalty that makes them such a force of good later in the story. But what it boils down to, I think, is how the Fellowship operates as a whole, and this is where I think the book really misses the boat. What the book doesn't really convey, at least from what I could see, is just how very unusual this Fellowship is. There are representatives of men, elves, and dwarves, three races who historically don't get along that well, as well as hobbits who are constantly being underestimated by the other races. And it's like what E.T. was saying about Legolas and Gimli. It's just not established very well that there's any sort of animosity between these races. Sure, Tolkien tells us that there is, but that's not really enough. Where's the evidence? What actions and reactions from the others are there to show us that there's tension between them? The movie made a smart move by showing almost palpable tension between these races, and showing us just how hard it was to get them to come together to fight Sauron. It makes the bond of the Fellowship, which is very close and familial, that much stronger. And since the ultimate message of the book seems to be that the forces of good uniting together are ultimately stronger than forces of evil with separate agendas, the stronger bond of the Fellowship in the movie makes it more representative of this idea. It's back again. It's just the fans, isn't it? The, the regular viewers? This is something else. Something else. Damn. They have a YouTube troll. Run! You cannot pass! Go back to the depths of your parents' basements from whence he came! I am the servant of rational discourse! Let your poor grammar and unreasonable, idiotic rage cease! Your bigoted, ignorant blather shall not avail you! Go wallow in your own filthy, unshowered, antisocial, self-loathing, unthinking idiocy! You shall not pass! Don't! That wasn't the end of it. We need to get this review to the end of the trail now. Someone's got to stay here and hold off the trolls. And someone's got to find the other two background singers. We'll be fine on our own. We will. Hatter, you stay here. I'll go. What? I'll take the review where it needs to go. They're going to need your reason on their side. You stay here and fight. Red, you can't make it by yourself. I'll make it. Number three, go with him. Right. 